As Jean said, my name is Kara Durr, and um, I'm going to be presenting my research today on microcredit in Indonesia. Um, thank you so much for coming. It's really great to see so many people here. Um, so my project is titled Microcredit in Indonesia, an exploration of the social benefits and consequences for women who have received microloans. So before I talk about my own research, I thought it would be useful to kind of give some background information on microcredit um, and some different uh, debates that are going on currently within it. So microcredit, as probably many of you know, is just basically defined as small scale loans given to poor or low income clients. Um, it's been described as the silver bullet against poverty and it's been very hyped up within the last decade, um, but there's also a number of criticisms that come with that. Um, so just to give kind of a range of the scope of microcredit, there are approximately 91 million borrowers worldwide, um, and of that, roughly 70% are women. So there is a real focus on lending to women, and this is for a number of different reasons. Um, historically, women have had a uh, lack of access to credit, and they've been more excluded from the development process. So microcredit has kind of been something that has really worked to include them in that. Um, there's also some different ideas. One is that women are a good credit risk, that they're going to pay their loans uh, with more frequency. Um, and then also a lot of these essentialist ideas coming out of feminist theory inform this as well. Um, ideas such as women are more trustworthy, um, women are going to use the resources to go towards the family, things like that. Um, that kind of shapes the development policy. Um, so, as I said, you know, it's definitely been something that is very praised within development circles. Um, a lot of international development organizations put forth this rhetoric. Um, for women, they say it creates what's known as a virtuous upward spiral, um, which kind of encompasses economic, social, political empowerment, as well as gender empowerment. Um, here's just kind of another way to look at that as the series of interconnected things that uh, elevate women's status. Um, and then also uh, it gives, as I said, economic opportunities to women in a way that they previously didn't have. So on the other hand, there are a number of criticisms, um, a lot put forth by anthropologists and other researchers. Um, one criticism is that microfinance organizations are only concerned with profit and they're not concerned about the welfare of the clients. Um, a good example of this would be a microfinance organization Compartmentos in, or Compartamos, sorry, in uh, Mexico that a few years ago sold and made millions after charging their clients 100% APR interest. Um, also, uh, it creates unmanageable debt for people. They say it's just giving them debt and not really giving them the tools to um, lift themselves out of poverty. Um, Another argument is that the social pressure, because um, usually in these organizations, they're put together in a loan group with other women or other people, um, and there's a lot of social pressure to make these payments on loans, um, and there's a lot of cases of this being very extreme, causing people to commit suicide in extreme cases and things like that. Um, and then finally, women don't always have control over the loans. While they might get them, perhaps their husband or older family members take them over. So I did my research in Indonesia. Um, I was on the island of Java in East Java. So the reason why I picked Indonesia is because Indonesia has a really long history of success with microcredit, but it's very underrepresented in the literature. The literature that is presented on Indonesian microcredit takes a very financial standpoint. Um, so I was interested in looking at um, microcredit in, in Indonesia, kind of looking at the more social aspects and seeing how the cultural context of Indonesia played into the outcomes for women. So my central research questions just basically have to do with um, the idea of how do Indonesian women conceive of their participation in such programs? You know, do they consider it a success? Do they feel that they are empowered? Things like that. And then of course that cultural consideration as well. So for my field work, I spent six months on East Java. Um, for the first two months while I was there, I received a scholarship through the US State Department Critical Language Scholarship to study Indonesian, which is the language there. Um, and then that was followed by four months of research. Um, I received substantial funding through the university for this, which allowed me to stay for six months, which was really great, and I think really um, contributed to making the project what it was. Um, while I was there, I researched at uh, Corporasi Juanita Satu, or I'll call it KWS, um, which is a microcredit cooperative. 
um, that is specifically to women. Um, for my field work, I attended group meetings and I conducted interviews with women and gave them a survey um, in order to see how they conceived of their participation. So for my research findings, I, I came to very different conclusions than what is presented in the broader microcredit literature. Um, and I think it's kind of useful to look at these different claims that microcredit makes. Um, so microcredit you know, promises that gender empowerment is going to happen for women. They will have increased social standing and networking. And then of course, that there's economic benefits to their participation. Um, so I'm gonna kind of look at each of these uh, promises and then kind of contrast what I found with them. So in terms of gender empowerment, it's the idea that women will gain self-confidence and respect within their families and communities as a result of receiving a microloan. Um, an example of this is um, all the microcredit organizations in Bangladesh, such as the Greening Bank, which you've probably heard of. Um, in Bangladesh, women were very disempowered, I guess you could argue. Um, many women uh, are under the social and religious restriction of purda, which kind of relegates them to the home, and it's kind of considered not appropriate for them to venture outside of the house. So for them, microcredit really did emerge as um, this tool that they could use, and it kind of gave them a legitimate uh, social avenue to pursue. Um, so in Bangladesh, it really was this tool for gender empowerment. However, in Indonesia, this was not the case. Um, it's interesting, while there might be gender inequality at a broader societal level, at the household level, Indonesian women are very empowered. Um, there's a long history of household decision making, um, and Indonesian women are usually considered to be the more financially adept of uh, partners, and they usually handle all the household finances. This is uh, just a quote I really liked from Hildred Geertz. This is back in the 60s, so you can see this is uh, something that is, is very embedded in the culture. It just says that um, there's little and less that women don't know about the man's world, basically. So it's interesting that despite at the household level women appear to be very empowered, KWS, which is the microcredit organization, still uses this rhetoric of women's empowerment as one of their goals. Um, and I, of course, would have to question that because I think, to me, women seem very empowered in this area. Um, for a lot of women, I think that managing and receiving a microloan is really just kind of a culturally appropriate and natural extension of their already established household duties. So another promise of microcredit is that participation within the microloan groups will lead to increased social standing and networking. Um, the system that most microcredit uh, organizations use is called joint responsibility system, in this case, Tangoon Renting. In this system, members are jointly liable for each other's loans. So if one woman can't make a payment, the group has to make the payment for her. Um, so this, it creates this really interesting dynamic where groups are both a source of support and a lot of social pressure. Um, and additionally, members have to approve other members' loans by signing off on them. Um, so it's kind of interesting because within this, there's a lot of tension between um, what joint responsibility system is supposed to be and how it really operates. Um, there's a number of cultural and social norms that come into play here. Um, so Indonesians are very private about finances. And there's also kind of still a social stigma attached to receiving a loan. So these things make it very difficult for women to talk about their loan activities, which generally that is kind of the basis of a microcredit group is everybody knows what everybody is borrowing for. Um, so, huh? A little gossipy. Yeah. <laughs> They're not gossiping here. <laughs> Um, so also these cultural norms place a lot of value on social harmony. So nobody wants to rock the boat by denying a fellow member a loan, for example. Um, so it's interesting in this way, social pressure functions very different than in a lot of other places. It's not social pressure to repay the loan specifically because a lot of times the women don't know who are paying the loans or who aren't, but it's more social pressure to maintain the status quo in this instance. Um, and then it, it was interesting to note that a lot of women said they joined for social benefits, um, that they didn't really need the loans or care about the loans. Um, but then a lot of them also reported that they were very unfamiliar with each other in the group, which is interesting. Um, my research assistant said, oh, do you really think all these women joined just for social reasons? No, they joined because they, they don't want to admit they need a loan. So it's interesting that in this case, social reasons might have emerged as kind of a, a a way to avoid saying that they needed a loan. 
Um, and then finally, of course, microcredit promises economic gains. That's the kind of the whole premise of it. Um, but it's, it's a very specific formula. So women are supposed to use their microloan to start a business, which then they will get money to pay back their loan and they will increase their overall household economy. Um, it's interesting in the case of KWS that two thirds of the members essentially are engaging in what's termed non-income generating activities. So they're using these loans for consumption. They might be paying for um, children's school, they might be renovating their house, taking a vacation, or just buying food, you know? Um, and it's interesting because the organization also promotes this idea that entrepreneurship is I the ideal, even though this isn't really the case. Um, it's interesting, again, I talked a little bit about Grameen Bank, but Mohammed Yunus, the founder, said, this is his definition of microcredit. So let's first define what microfinance or microcredit is. It's lending money to the poorest women for income generating activity without collateral so she can help herself out of poverty. So that's pretty cut and dry. <laughs> Um, nonetheless, um, a lot of the women found that these loans were very valuable, especially if they were able to pay for their children's school. Um, also, a lot of scholars have talked about the benefits of consumption smoothing. So um, you've probably heard the idea that the poor live on $2 a day, but um, it's really not $2 every day. It's maybe $3 one day, a dollar the next day, maybe nothing the next day. Um, so these loans can kind of act as a way to smooth those income gaps. Um, and then for the members, they found this program to be successful and they found it to have success in their lives, even though the, the definition put forth by microcredit organizations, in particular KWS, was very different. So in conclusion, Indonesia presents a very unique case study. It really differs from a lot of the existing literature. Um, for women in my case study, the loans were helpful, but they weren't life-changing. They were just kind of a mere convenience. And it's interesting because I, I kind of felt that they looked at loans almost the way that I would look at a loan, as a convenience, um, maybe making an investment, but certainly not a life-changing thing. Um, and women still found value in their participation. So I think the takeaway point from this is that microcredit cannot be a one-size-fits-all program. We can't say that these are going to be the outcomes because it's very different from place to place. Cultural norms really come into play um, and things like that. And I think approaches where individual women participants are consulted rather than perhaps taking an organizational standpoint are also very important um, because as we see the, I, the ideas that the organization had and the ideas that the women had about their success was very different. Um, and then finally we just need to remember that success is an idea that's rooted in a particular perspective and in this case the perspective of the women and the perspective of microcredit organizations or, or the broader discourse is very different. So I uh, received funding for this research from a number of places. So I'd just like to thank Dick and Lynn Cheney, um, the UW Social Justice Research Center, the UW College of Arts and Sciences, and the US Department of State. The end, thank you. <laughs>